Hi, I'm Joe and welcome to Rookie Review. Now this week we have a very special guest from the cast of Avengers Infinity War, Rocket Raccoon. So Rocket, first and most obvious question, why did you let all your friends just go off to face Thanos and certain death? No? Why you just buggered off with Thor? Nothing. Nothing at all. Nothing to say for yourself? One a hole. Hi, and welcome to Rookie Review. I'm Joe, and my special guest this week, hailing from Muggle England, Tony. Hi, Joe. Thanks for having me. So because we've had a review which was completely spoiler free, this is going to be our spoiler chat. We're going to go to practically everything about the movie, the plot, the deaths, there's oh so many deaths. And basically just going into detail. So if you haven't seen the movie, what have you been doing for the last week of your life? Go see it, go check it out, maybe check it out two, three times, however, you know, however much you want to enjoy it. And then come back and watch this video because I don't want to be spoiling it for anyone. So this is just for people who either don't care or have seen the movie and just want to hear a little discussion about it. Enjoy. The gauntlet's off. Ooh, you see what I did yeah, there? If we talked every week about Infinity War, that would be a good <laughs> play for the show, but I think it might wear a bit thin after a while. So the previous video, you know, Thanos did demand our silence, mm -hmm. but this week, Thanos can f*** off. First of all, everybody dies. Everybody. No one is safe in this film, and I think that's what makes it so interesting and makes it so unsettling. Like, you, you normally go into a Marvel film, and there's that sense of security where you're like, oh, it's okay, everybody will be all right in the end, the good guy will prevail. Not in this film. Thor Ragnarok, if you stay for the after credit scene, ends on all the Asgardians safe on the ship with the main characters of Thor, Loki, Heimdall, Valkyrie, and our personal favourite, Korg and Meek. <laughs> and then the after credit scene is Thanos' ship basically coming into shot and totally engulfing the Asgardian ship. Mm-hmm. Now I thought going into this movie that would be a perfect opening scene is basically Thanos and his henchmen ransacking the ship, attacking Thor and Hulk etc. But it kind of disappoints me the fact that the opening scene, that's already been done and there's three major points I think would have been awesome scenes in this movie. Would have been the attack on the Asgardian ship. Nebula is mentioned as trying to assassinate Thanos and if you watch Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2 she kind of leaves the team to go and try and do that. Mm -hmm. That is not shown in this movie or any other movie and then the power stone is already in his gauntlet when the movie starts now for me we've been building up to this for 10 years the whole mcu is 10 years but the infinity stone specifically is six years so for thanos to already have a stone you know, each stone is represented as being as important as the last so for him to have already claimed a stone off screen in a no doubt epic and awesome battle because on xandar they have the nova corp which yeah. may eventually one day get thrown a movie that just be kind of like, oh, I have enough screen. I was mentioning that in the line. That was insane to me mm -hmm. because they spent a shit ton of money on this film, like over three hundred million dollars. I think combined with the marketing and Avengers Four, it came to over like a billion dollars to make this movie. I'm sure they could have coughed up a hundred or two hundred million more to make those three action scenes. Yeah. And I would have gladly sat through a four-hour movie to see those scenes included. So I thought the opening, though a good scene to represent Thanos and how ominous he was. I felt like there was like two to three other scenes that could have came before that and yeah. I would have been perfectly happy. Yeah. Like I want to see, I'd love to see a four hour cut of this movie. I feel as if in some respects that kind of undermines what came before because there's just this kind of, we've got to drive on with our own plot um, and I don't think you can neglect what's came before. So that was a little bit disappointing. It seemed like it completely undermined the value of that stone in particular Yeah. because the other five stones are claimed in that movie mm -hmm. and they each have their own designated time from claiming it. That could have been one of the most spectacular and interesting parts of the movie and where you have an awesome fight scene on Titan and an awesome fight scene in Wakanda. Why not have an awesome fight scene on Xandar? Mm -hmm. Like that would have been a fantastic opening to the movie. Yeah. It's quite an understated opening to a movie. Tonally and visually it's quite interesting. In terms of an epic action opening, it's quite understated, but not necessarily in a good way, and perhaps from a Marvel fanboy perspective, disappointing that we didn't get to see that fight or them attacking the mm -hmm. Asgardians. It's all, the fight's already done with yeah. the Asgardians. 
I would love to have seen Thor go against Thanos. Mm. Obviously, he lost. That would have been awesome to see. Yeah. So that was a bit disappointing. And it would have been interesting to see, for example, how's Korg going to fight? Did Korg survive? <laughs> Meek died once then came back, so we know he's like made a fair of stuff for Korg. Is yeah. he there? So that's interesting. I personally reckon Valkyrie escaped with Korg and Meek. I hope to God, Korg and Meek escaped. And that's going to be like how the next Thor opens. Do you reckon there will be another Thor? I would like to see another Thor. I would like to think that there is a demand for another one. Since Ragnarok, you think yeah, they kind of revitalised and reinvented the character? Yeah. I don't necessarily want to see a Thor movie. I want to see Thor become a guardian because yeah. that banter and camaraderie mm-hmm. he had with not only Rocket and Groot throughout the entire movie but just in that scene with Chris Pratt which was brilliant I always yeah. loved them bouncing off each other so <laughs> I don't necessarily know Thor's my favourite Avenger I don't necessarily want to see another Thor movie I'd like to see him team up because I think though I'm quite unique in the sense where I like the Thor franchise like one and two by themselves I think Hemsworth is a fantastic all round performer but comedic talent mm-hmm. so when you plop him into the Avengers He's hilarious. When you give him Loki and Hulk and Valkyrie to bounce off in Ragnarok, it's brilliant. Then when you put him with the Guardians, he's this character that gets enhanced by yeah, everything about he's him. he's very versatile. Yes, he is. So I don't really want to see... I'd want to see Thor, Korg and Meek become Guardians. That yeah, would be definitely. the perfect volume Can three. you imagine, like, Korg and Groot? And oh. Korg not speaking Groot. Korg and Rocket. This Rocky. could work very well. The dynamics between... Um, those three and the Guardians, I think, would work very nicely. Give us a call, Faggy. No, I thought it was a good opening. It was um, it was very dramatic and it set the stakes very high. Mm. However, I don't think Loki should have died, not even necessarily so quickly. I'm kind of okay with the character having a certain shelf life. Yeah. But what I didn't like was how he was killed. I agree with this completely. So he goes to stab Thanos from the front. Like, the god of mischief, and the only thing he can think of is to stab someone yeah. from the front. It's just completely out of character. I think that happens quite a few times in this movie, mm-hmm. in terms of characters having a lapse in judgement and not acting how you'd usually expect them to. Now, that may be because uh, we've seen these characters mm-hmm. put on the screen with different directors and writers before, now they're in the hands of other people, and these writers and directors, though, did a phenomenal job they may not understand the characters as well as just basically whoever came before. So, yeah, it was very stupid for Loki, arguably the most intelligent, cunning character in the entire MCU, to do something so stupid. You'd think, like, Loki would play the long game and go, okay, I'll team up with Thanos now mm-hmm. in a couple of weeks wait or to, months. Wait till he's asleep. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Get the gauntlet off. <laughs> I mean, if, if you're ever going to tell me Loki's going to stab someone, I imagine doing it from behind, like, yeah. in the back. I would never think the god of mischief would just go... <laughs> it, just, it would never work I mean I could see what was coming Thanos must have seen it a million miles exactly. away Exactly. it felt like okay how do we get rid of this character as quickly as possible and just get on with our film absolutely it felt like because he had no real place in this movie he couldn't add anything to it all he could bring was a dramatic death early mm-hmm. on now I'm a big fan of Loki and I was genuinely distraught when he died in Dark World but when they brought him back, I was like, that's kind of short-changed. His death undermined it. But then he was so brilliant and Ragnarok and him taking over Asgard. Mm-hmm. So I was happy with that. But I was also fully with that. He does have a shelf life. There's not much more he can do. He was a symp- sympathetic villain in the first Thor. He was now now crazy villain in Avengers. He, was, he redeemed himself in Thor The Dark World. And he was kind of on the edge in Ragnarok. And so I liked he died as a hero, but his purpose seemed to be we kill off this fan-favorite character straight away. Mm-hmm that's his purpose but just how it how it came about it was good it was good placement in the movie it needed to happen because as i said i don't think they can take the character anywhere new i think hillston's kind of done with the character but i just think it undermined his intelligence as a character that we've seen in so many prime movies my other problem in terms of deaths in the opening scene was heimdall you made a good point of why did he save hulk and not transport yeah. everyone else why did he send hulk if you're gonna pick the three why would you not choose your king because hulk just got his ass handed to him by thanos and was probably, here's my arse. <laughs> <laughs> got his arse hand, I never had, you don't get the arse handed to them physically, like, here you go. <laughs> I think, one, it needs it for the plot, but you'd have to think about it, mm. common sense. Because Hulk just got beaten by Thanos, I believe he was transforming back into Bruce Banner. Mm. So I think of the three, he's the weakest, needs the most help. But yeah, right off the bat, the two characters that die, I did like that. 
because they are mainstays, they are some of the characters yeah. we were first ever introduced in Phase 1. We're not really used to that in Marvel as well. Well, that's the whole point of this movie. People dying. Yeah. Something that I liked about the opening scene was the fact that you see Hulk going up against Thanos. Mm. It was cool to see that. Uh, a big green guy go up against a big purple guy. Like a big yeah. overgrown Oscar the Grouch versus a big overgrown Grimace. Yeah. And so they face off. Who and doesn't it, want to see that? I'd pay. I'd pay Sesame Street and McDonald's to make that movie yeah. happen. Once again, Hollywood, come, come call, come knocking. So that was awesome. I, I liked how it wasn't an overblown fight. It was quite quick. It was yeah. probably less than a minute. But it was also awesome to see that Hulk lost. We never really mm-hmm. see Hulk lose a hand-to-hand combat. So I think after this point, Thanos is represented as a very manipulative, cunning, evil, sadistic villain. This is the point we just see him be like a badass and a physical threat, so he can be either or. Mm-hmm. I know I like that they didn't play on that too much, like he's not just fists, like a lot of Marvel villains are bad and that's the whole purpose. And it was still great to see that first initial fight scene without it being dragged on too long. But that's another point, this is the only point we really get to see Hulk in the entire movie. Yeah. Now if I was a little kid, I'd be like, where the hell is Hulk? <laughs> now if you go back and listen to Kevin Feige, he basically says that because they're not in a position to, to do a solo Hulk movie because of all the rights and distribution issues with Universal. What they were planning on doing is having a whole cabin arc over the course of many movies. So it began in Ultron, continued in Ragnarok, and will finish up in these two Avengers movies. And this is just yet another point that emphasizes this is not one whole movie. Because the whole point of Banner from that point is finally trying and wanting to get the Hulk out, but the Hulk refusing, when it's usually the other way around. But it it was quite frustrating to see it's like I don't care what psychological issues yeah. you've got going on just get him out yeah. first of all what a douche the hulk is why would you knock him out and like be a hero why are you like because powering because bruce banner dies then the hulk is dead but so... like you come out to fight in the prior movies now they need it more yeah. than ever and you won't come out it kind of felt silly like someone says mean words to him in the other films and he starts going green yeah. but in this film he's like no all my friends are gonna die yeah yeah might, might finally get me a movie if they all die <laughs> so it just frustrates me because like so many aspects about this movie, it emphasizes... Though Marvel's like, it's definitely not a two-part. It's definitely not a two-part. It's definitely a movie. It's definitely not. This is part one of part two. So there's so many dangling things, mm-hmm. which though I'm curious to see how they'll all tie up. As I've said in my review, it's not building anticipation with me. It's building frustration because if it doesn't pay off and the dramatic things they have dangling aren't as epic mm-hmm. as it's going to be or they're going to basically bulldoze everything they did in this movie, then... This movie's basically going to become unwatchable. It's like, oh, this, all these things happened, but we know yeah. everyone's going to be okay. And if you're not a big Marvel fanboy who like knows all the prior movies and sees all the individual characters develop, just for a casual movie, go be like, well, where the hell's the Hulk and what the hell's going on? So I just didn't really care for that plot line. I was like, it doesn't make any sense why Hulk wouldn't come out. It wasn't fun to see Bruce Banner slapping himself in a bush. <laughs> that sounds quite rude. <laughs> It doesn't make sense, like for many characters, that mm-hmm. this is happening to him at this time. Yeah. Little mm-hmm. Rusey Banner. <laughs> so I do think that the character of Bruce Banner didn't really pay off in this movie for me. He had this internal struggle, which if it was in any other movie, I might have found more of an interesting character arc. But in this movie, it just felt really irritating. I would have been okay with this subplot line and with this character development of Bruce Bruce Banner ever had a payoff at the end of this movie like in the Wakanda battle he finally came out but he didn't but in terms of character development and character arcs there was no closure for a lot of people and Bruce Banner is probably the biggest one yeah so that was very frustrating and that's what really annoys me about two-parter films I personally but it's not a two-parter but it is it's a two-parter. two-parter it is Marvel yeah. and also the fact that he, why was he the comedic relief in this movie it makes no sense to his character for someone so intelligent to be so stupid. Banner being the comedic relief, that is my problem for a lot of characters. Every single time something important is introduced, it's undermined by comedy. He introduced Thanos for the first time with all the Asgardians wiped out, 50%. Thanos says you talk too much. Mm-hmm. You have Gamora making Star-Lord promise that he will kill her, i.e. love of his life. Undermined with Drax just standing there. Chowing down, chowing down. some space nuts. Um, that sounded rude again. <laughs> love of her space nuts. <laughs> Thor making his new hammer, the Stormbreakers, undermined by that weird back and forth between him and Dinklage. Just completely unnecessary. The humour, when when done right at the right moment, did enhance mm-hmm. the film. 
I really liked the Doctor Strange movie. I know you weren't the world's biggest fan, but I like yeah. the more offbeat movies. Like I love Ant Man, Guardians, Ragnarok, and I really did like Doctor Strange and all the visual aspects to it. But in this movie, he comes across as quite douchey. Yeah. Like he's just constantly rude and thinks he's better than everyone. It's quite pretentious. And you said like wasn't that the point of his character arc in Doctor Strange to stop being like that? But what I did love about Doctor Strange, especially the fight on Titan, is that it really was a fantastic showcase for his powers and his abilities. And I think a positive of this movie is that for the first time, it doesn't feel like it's Tony Stark and co. Yeah, you watch the first Avengers, these characters, these Earthbound heroes are meeting gods and monsters for the first time, and yet it still feels like Iron Man's the most pivotal. Mm-hmm. Thor had a whole plotline to himself, and when he's introduced, he's deemed as so important. He's the one that almost kills Thanos. So it's these genuinely more powerful characters like Doctor Strange, like Thor, that get, I think, the best action moments and mm-hmm. are deemed to be the most pivotal to overcoming and beating Thanos. And so going back to Doctor Strange, I think his fight scene did bring all kind of the visual flair from the Doctor Strange movies into this, yeah. which was what the Russos did very well. They did take the cinematography and style from the other movies and place it all into one. When the Guardian's introduced, it feels like a Guardian's movie, mm-hmm. even with the soundtrack. When it's Doctor Strange versus Thanos, when he multiplies himself, it feels like Doctor Strange. But however, you had a really valid point about the Time Stone, Doctor Strange's usage of it. Why doesn't he use the Time Stone? Why doesn't he just turn back the clock to before Thanos has any of the stones that he can use it against the villains of this movie? And when we were watching the movie, correct me if I'm wrong, fans, but he uses it once against Ebony Moore, and even then he fails to actually put it into action. If you can control time, when you just freeze everything, just whoop, take his gauntlet off and like <laughs> run away with it. Yeah, like the scene on Titan, why aren't they using the stone to freeze him? Why are they relying on Mantis? And why aren't they using the one weapon they have yeah. against him? It's weird that the stones individually have been presented as so powerful because they've all been in basically a movie by themselves. And then cumulatively, the scene has like the most powerful things ever. Mm-hmm. Yet the the usage and limitations of the stones aren't fully explained. Yeah. Because when Thanos has like five out of six, what he does with it when he wants it, when he arrives on Wakanda is quite limited. He, he's just pushing people away with the power yeah. stones. He does something with Bruce Banner in the Iron Man suit, like getting stuck in stone. Yeah. And why can't you use all these stones that do all these magical things, do fantastic things? I think the reality stone is the only one that gets a good like. Insight. presentation like yeah. Drax is turned into rocks Mantis is turned like ribbon he uses it against Doctor Strange he turns like Star Lord's phaser into bubbles so the reality stone had a good like run out of thing but on the whole yeah. once he had it so, like he's just powerful like well didn't you just need the power stone yeah couldn't you just got the reality stone just the one like I will make reality however I want it to be and 50% of the people will go why did you need all six well, it's like a special limited edition line he wants them all He's just a big fanboy like the rest of them, isn't he? <laughs> yeah, the stones are presented as these very, very important things, but then both the heroes and villains' usage of it is like... Like, if Loki had the Tetrarch, i.e. the Space Stone, couldn't he just, like, transport it himself and Thor and Heimdall and Hulk and all the Asgardians away right at the beginning of the movie as soon as mm. Thanos attacked us? So, when you introduce such high-concept, fantastical, cosmic things, there's always going to be things that are a bit off and plot holes if they are the main focus of this movie in the last six years worth of movies you kind of have to nail them down of like this is how you can use them this is who can use yeah. them so if you, as you said to Doctor Strange use it once in the entire movie and for him to kind of not even kind of succeed in using it felt kind of weird yeah but I did like the whole Thanos versus Doctor Strange on Titan I thought it was a spectacular fight sequence and the whole anti-gravity aspect to Titan where like Doctor Strange puts the platforms off for Star-Lord. I liked that and I did pick up on the fact that as well they're all using their unique yeah. powers and skills to yeah. aid each other and that's another thing that made it such a great fight scene. I think maybe Marvel as a whole have realised that we don't just have to continue banking on the Iron Man franchise, mm-hmm. we have a whole new era of heroes, we've yeah. got Spider-Man back, Black Panther was a billion dollar hit, people love the Guardians, I think they're coming to the realisation that Oh, we don't have to have Tony Stark in like every other scene. It's felt like the first Avengers movie where it felt like an ensemble, not Tony Stark and co. Yeah, and um, because of this, he should have died. Generally thought there'd be no cop-out deaths in this movie. Marvel are the kings of cop-out deaths. That's the main irritation I have is that for the first two and a bit phases, the stakes haven't felt really high. Mm-hmm. Because aside from 
Thor's ma. Quicksilver being introduced and killed off in the same yeah. movie. So I genuinely didn't think there'd be any cop outs in this in this film because I think Marvel had enough of that. They've had a lifetime's mm-hmm. worth just in the first two phases. So to have Tony Stark get stabbed, which is like oh my god moment, and then yet again just like oh, oh he's not sorry. dead, it's fine, mm-hmm. don't worry. For me, what would have made it more badass because the whole setup is Doctor Strange will trade the Time Stone for Tony Stark's life. For me, what would be more badass would have been Thanos agreeing to that trade, taking the Time Stone, and then go, I'm still gonna let him die. Yeah. What is his purpose of leaving Tony Stark alive? I don't know. The MCU doesn't need him. It doesn't make sense for Thanos' character. And it would have been, instead of us all talking about Spider-Man being the main death, that would have been the, oh my god, death, no more Tony Stark. So I was annoyed that in a movie that promised death, we did actually get a cop-out. One thing I did like about the fight on Titan was, you know, when Spidey's collecting everyone unconscious and he's like, I got you, I got you. I'm really sorry, I can't remember anyone's names. That's oh. when the humour works. Exactly. Outside of the Guardians, I do think Spider-Man is the other great comic relief. Yeah. I do think that is perfect casting. Yeah. And Tom Holland's performance since being introduced in Civil War has been continuously mm-hmm. fantastic. Like Thor, he is enhanced by the character. Yeah. Not, not necessarily his performance, the character is enhanced by other characters around him. That's why I like about this movie, you're taking Earthbound heroes mm-hmm. and having them go up against aliens. You're not going to see Spider-Man go against an alien in his own movie. Yeah. He's going to go against criminals with enhanced weaponry like Vulture and yeah. Scorpion. So to have Spidey go against these aliens it's really cool mm-hmm. to see and in a way you can overcome this by pop culture references of sci-fi movies like, i know yeah. how to defeat this alien from aliens yeah it's really old movie <laughs> <laughs> this is old movie empire strikes back but not only was he a great comic relief but that particular death scene when thanos does click his fingers and everybody dies they just kind of fade away and it's once the anticlimactic but it, it it does take you back to it all just they're all just going. But it's the Tom Holland's performance when he dies, which yeah. apparently was completely improvised. When he goes, that is so devastating. Like the perform like for a movie with such spectacle, there are like four moments of fantastic acting and this is one of them where he's saying he doesn't feel well and he says he doesn't want to go and they say he's sorry. It is absolutely devastating, especially as it's Tony Stark who's holding him because he was his mentor. Mm-hmm. Tony Stark's the one who basically brought him into the fold in the Civil War. He's the one who taught him to be a hero in Homecoming. That scene between the two of them is genuinely touching for like yeah. a big action blockbuster. And really does give you gotta give kudos for Tom Holland like, to mm-hmm. be, to hold your own in those scenes and to really stand out and have have the countless deaths in the movie that to be the most memorable. And Tony Stark's reaction when Spidey exactly. goes that's the yeah. other like another fantastic moment of acting is that he's so shell shocked. Mm-hmm. He's not like like a Darth Vader like no. It's like it's so understated where he's like. Like, touching his hands because yeah. his, his friend was once there now he's just dust Robert Downey Jr. as Iron Man is just basically Robert Downey Jr.'s mm-hmm. charming charismatic self it's like arrogance in a metal suit yeah but like that's why we love him but there are moments for the entire MCU where he does actually act he chooses to act <laughs> instead of being himself so Tom Holland's death and then Robert Downey Jr.'s reaction is one of the most poignant mo- moments in the whole movie also to talk about that scene Doctor Strange giving over the Time Stone didn't make any sense. Mm-hmm. His whole character up to that point has been the gatekeeper of the Time Stone and he even says if, to Tony Stark, if the choice between you, the kid, or the stone, I will not hesitate. So for him to give him the stone doesn't make any sense unless, and this could be a major Avengers 4 mm-hmm. uh, plot line, is that when Doctor Strange looks into the future and he says there's like 14,605 different possibilities. How is this- that really the number that he yeah. says? That's an impressive memory. I wrote it down. <laughs> <laughs> I could also, someone, some bigger fan voice might keep wrong. <laughs> it's 14,604,000. <laughs> but regardless, I believe it's 14,605 different outcomes. There's only one in which they win. So I personally think, though, now if this doesn't pan out, this was a ridiculous thing for the character to do and another lapse in judgment. But if it does pan out, this is very clever filmmaking because not only does he hand over the stone, but then when he starts to fade away and die, he says, we're in the end game. He doesn't say you're frightened or like we've lost. And so if that does pan out, I think Marvel have not only put a lot of importance on the Doctor Strange character going forward for their phase four and beyond, but it's very, very clever filmmaking. And everyone's probably going to come out and go, why, why did he do that? Why did he? But if you think if you listen, if you put the points together of Doctor Strange on Titan, I do think that he did it on purpose. And that though everyone does die initially, the outcome will be they'll get most and not all those characters back. And it will be because of this decision and what it leads to. But if it doesn't, uh, bullshit.
The filmmaking doesn't make any sense for the character. So the other great acting chops in this movie, I would say. Chops. chops. You, 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 got, you got good chops, kid. Good acting chops. <laughs> The problem? <laughs> I don't think I've heard that before. Everyone else has. So we've referenced two fantastic scenes of acting in this spectacle. I would say another one would be Chris Hemsworth's performance as Thor. Yeah. Particularly in the scene where he's in the pod with Rocket and Groot. And Rocket's trying to get like stuff out of him. Some small talk. Some small talk, just kind of getting to know him. Mm-hmm. And basically Thor goes on about everyone that he's lost. His mom, his dad, his brother, his sister, <laughs> his entire planet, his entire city of people. And he basically ends the monologue with what else have I got to lose? And he's kind of say it kind of in a joking way, like he doesn't really care, but like I think a tear comes down his eyes. I just think the first two Thor movies that I enjoy, he came across as quite stilted, and then I think they went the absolute opposite end with Ultron and Ragnarok being quite comedic. Mm-hmm. This, I think, is a fantastic balance. I just thought it was an incredible acting to be like balancing the staunch, quite stilted Thor with the comedic Thor with the more human thought we're beginning to see mm-hmm. and it is these small nuanced moments of downtime in the plot yeah where the characters do develop and come into their own i really liked the scenes between the action so with marvel films that is what starts to bore me is the really fast-paced cgi driven mm. fight scenes but it's these glimpses in between where you develop the characters and move the story along that are really touching. Now the other performance isn't a particular scene, it's just Josh Brolin's entire performance as Thanos. Mm -hmm. Now Marvel don't have a particularly fantastic track record of great villains. There are a few, like obviously a Loki's fan favourite, I personally like Red Skull. I think later down the line they have been making better villains. Killmonger from Black Panther I thought was great. The Planet Ego being Star Wars father was a good relationship for the movie. Vulture, Michael Keaton's performance as Vulture. All of the villains that you are describing now all have a motivation they all have a backstory Mm -hmm. that's what makes these characters so believable is that they have a motive that you can get on board with they're not just bad yeah they're not just i want to destroy everything basically not the dark elves i was just that's exactly who i was thinking of yep but the weird thing is, though Thanos gives a continuously brilliant performance, it's not the beginning scene where he fights Hulk, where it's like, oh, he's a great film. It is yeah. his manipulation and possessiveness with Gamora. That's brilliant. I liked the fact that when Peter Quill has the gun against Gamora and he goes to shoot and it just spouts bubbles and Thanos says, I like him. It's like this weird father-daughter relationship being developed where the father is approving of the conviction of the boyfriend. boyfriend. Yeah, that was good. It really was great. I think any scene that Brolin's in as Thanos is good. He's such a good actor. And there's so few action scenes. There's the Hulk fight and there's Titan aside from that Thanos is just talking. Yeah. And interacting predominantly with Gamora. But at the same time, you get that he's a villain. Mm. He doesn't have to be throwing his weight around exactly. for you to understand how evil he is. And that's something that Marvel's done really well in this film. Torturing Nebula. Yeah. There's quite a few torture scenes in this movie. And they, both, and they both <laughs> and they both stand up the torture scene with Nebula and Ebony yeah. Moore's torture. Doctor Strange is quite disturbing for a yeah. kid's movie and I thought were two standout scenes. Like, I did like those scenes a lot. Maybe that's speaking to my sadomasochistic side. I don't know, but I just thought they were very well acted and quite disturbing. But it's those sort of scenes where Thanos isn't even saying anything. It's just a glint in his eye. And if he does speak, it's very calmly and mm-hmm. quiet. And it's the scenes with Gamora, particularly when they go to the Soul Stone, which I think is phenomenal acting by Brolin as yeah. well. And ultimately in that scene, the whole purpose is that in order to get the Soul Stone, which up until this point, no one knows where it's been, he has to kill somebody that he loves in order to get that so he understands the purpose of a soul and ultimately therefore he has to kill Gamora because apparently that's the only character he does love. Good thing he decided to steal a child, right? Really. Yeah, yeah. Good thing he felt like he ends up liking it in the end as yeah. well because if he took Nebula instead of Gamora he would be been <laughs> But then again I do feel like that relationship, like a few partnerships are rushed in this movie. Like, it was touching and gave you empathy for the character. It was like, this is the first movie I've seen you two really interact aside from a brief glimpse in Guardians of the Galaxy. It's like, am I really supposed to care that you're killing your daughter to get this soul stone when I don't know how much you do actually love or care for her because I've only seen one or two flashback scenes. Yeah. So like, I don't understand why he took Gamora. We didn't get to see any scenes of her growing up with him. 
So though it was a touching scene and gave Brolin a lot to do acting wise, it, it did feel like they were trying to force emotion. Mm-hmm. I love the foreshadowing of the snapping of the fingers, which we see even in the trailer. Transpired that that's how he destroyed the universe in this movie. I loved just how his scene, possibly in the Soul Stone, we don't know, with a young Gamora right at the end when he finally mm-hmm. has killed everyone. And she goes, what did it cost you? And he says, everything. Like, he is content and he is happy that he's fulfilled his purpose, but there is a cost on his yeah. morality and his character. So I just thought everything about Thanos worked mm-hmm. incredibly well. And- I completely agree with that theory that that is the Soul Stone. Like, the orange hue mm. on it, it's got to be it's got to be in the soul stone but it's quite a bland setting so you is it gonna be really that fun to watch 20 characters dead inside know. this little like orange hue yeah. like how do we get out like tapping on the walls we'll find <laughs> out i'm sure it's marvel they'll do something dynamic they know fun. what they're doing yeah. but it's quite astounding that we get such a fantastic performance that everyone's kind of all in agreement that he is a great villain when we don't have much backstory for him he has so many throwaway lines that you're like well, what does that mean he actually has a motive to kill 50%. Okay, but the question is, why is that? It gives a, yeah. he, he talks briefly, like, oh, you know, I'm really a saviour, offering mercy. This it wasn't enough. Yeah. For, number four may develop into that further, but I thought if you were going to mine into that, this was the movie to do so. Like I said I would have loved to have seen a four-hour version of this movie, but all those action scenes included and more flashbacks between Thanos. Thanos as a younger character, understanding why he has this motivation, and Thanos bringing up Gamora and Nebula. I think would have still made a riveting four hour movie. Usually I would associate great villains with DC. I'd say less DC, more specifically Batman yeah, within DC. Definitely. So the Batman Rogues Gallery has got to be the strongest in comics or movies, yeah. but if this is the sort of calibre of villains we're getting yeah. from here on out, then yeah, uh, with the amount of conviction they put into because that's the whole point, it's been building for six years. Mm-hmm. If this villain fell flat, not only would this movie have failed, but the prior six years and build up would have failed. So the fact that they got it so right, I think they knew they had to yeah but they really did as per usual marvel casting perfectly brolin yeah. isn't necessarily the most famous actor he's not technically an a-list star he's a decent serviceable character actor which seems to be like a lot of actors be getting resurgence in his career I mean, he's got deadpool 2 coming up mm-hmm. later this year as well he'll be back again and um, for avengers World, and that's why i loved usually when a marvel movie ends it says either the avengers or thor or guardians will return we got thanos will return yeah. which emphasizes the conviction that this is a villain that we've invested in for six years he wasn't just going to be the villain of the week in this movie he will be back he will be back to cause more chaos in the next movie but i was a little content he looked at the end i kind of felt happy for him at the end he's like <laughs> sitting there like watching the sunset good. like oh i'm not nice he got, he got what he wanted i thought it was quite funny as well he's like, like a little hut in the exactly. grand palace right like exactly. a little simplistic hut he spent this whole movie talking about how much power he's going to have and he's got the, all the stones and the gauntlet and he chooses a little hut in the middle of nowhere. It's the simple things. It's the simple things, they mean a lot. Genocide of half the galaxy and then a little hut to go back to at the end of the day. So when they first arrive on the planet, which we think is called Formia, but there we're going to check. A, there's a gatekeeper yeah. who mines the soul stone. Who is Red Skull. How did you like that reveal? really liked that they've managed to keep that a secret i like the whole scene the whole setup the fact that it was kind of like a video game where it was like he was on a treasure hunt and in order to get this gem you have to give something up there needed to be someone explaining how to get the soul stone so they kind of needed the gatekeeper character yeah. and what i like about marvel is that no role goes away pointlessly like exactly it could have been anyone it could be this mystical cosmic character but they're like actually you know what we'll have a callback to this character yeah. which for years now people are like where is he where is he what was his fate so it kind of gave closure to his character because yeah. he probably doesn't have a purpose now that somebody's got the stone he doesn't have to be the gatekeeper yeah. this is the thing that i like about marvel is that you do feel like loose ends will get tied up eventually unless it's the incredible hulk there's a lot of deaths in this movie wheel them off and rack them up so the characters that die before the clicking of the fingers when Thanos finally gets all six Finty Stones are, as we mentioned, Loki and Heimdall, Vision, because he has to pluck it out of his head, yep. Gamora, which he has to do to get the Soul Stone, pretty much all the children of Thanos, which as I said we don't really care about apart from them anymore. Side note, terrible, terrible CGI, like was the CGI budget blown on Thanos? Was it necessary for those characters? The big guy with no. like, the hammer was good, but like... Ebony Moore, the female ch- child of Thanos. With the like 
Yeah, with the horns. Yeah, and, and the blue across her eyes. And the guy that almost got killed in the train station scene did not, did not need to be CGI. No. Rubbish. That's such a British, like, put down. Just rubbish. Positively rubbish. <laughs> Poppycock. <laughs> so, yeah, I agree. They were needless CGI. Yeah. But they all, I think, went. And I think the collector, which <laughs> means the world to me. Because he kind of, his last scene is him waving yeah. bye bye. Like, oh, Can hello. we just talk about that crazy clapping? <laughs> Magnificent! <laughs> It's pretty. I love pretty Sid El Toro. So I think uh, safe to assume the collector's gone. I don't think anyone apart from maybe me and you are going to care. <laughs> and maybe Jeff Goldblum because that's his character's his brother yeah. in, in the universe. <laughs> but there we go. But once he clicks his fingers, the characters that all die off. I'd say over fifty percent of the cast. He's like fifty percent go. It's practically all of yeah. them. So it is Scarlet Witch, Falcon, Black Panther, Winter Soldier, Groot. Drax, Mantis, Star Lord, Spider Man, Doctor Strange, and the after credit scene, Nick Fury and Maria Hill. Yeah. I personally believe that everyone who died before the clicking of the fingers with the gauntlet is gone. They're not coming back. Because it is a theory that every character that was taken through the use of the Infinity Gauntlet, their souls may be now trapped inside. Which I really like. The Soul Stone. Now, I don't know if this is a theory that's going to play out. I don't know if this is a common theory. Or... I'm not taking credit for this theory. I heard on the I Fanboy podcast. I do like the concept of them all being in the Soul Stone. Um, and because of all those deaths, we're only left with Iron Man, Nebula, Rocket, Thor, Cap, Bruce Banner, Black Widow. Black Widow. And we, because Hawkeye and Ant Man went in this movie, yeah. and Ant Man's getting his own movie, him and the Wasp are still alive. Yes. So for me, the worry is, is that if all those characters are trapped in the Soul Stone, and in part four, or should I say part two, number four, are they all going to come back? Because then that's therefore going to undermine the whole epicness of those final scenes in that movie. Now, I think there was enough characters in this movie not to particularly miss anyone, but I do think that Ant Man would have been an interesting mm. addition to the mix. Could have been like small, like try to like pop out one of the gems. Like, could like. Yeah. Where you went into Iron Man's suit, you could have like, gone into the gauntlet and yeah. got one out. So though I love the Iron Man character, and he would have been a nice inclusion, I do think he's going to be in number four. Mm-hmm. And the fact that he wasn't in this movie, he's getting basically a two-hour movie dedicated to him, to him later this summer. Yeah. So we don't have to miss him. Did you miss Hawkeye? Hawkeye, I could not care less about I personally wanted Hawkeye to be in this movie just so we seem die, to be perfectly <laughs> honest. I thought he should have died in Ultron. That's another thing that makes this movie so great, is that it's... <laughs> no Hawkeye. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's, it's downtime. Saves the plot. Yeah. The downtime in Age of Ultron was flat. Because it was all for Hawkeye. Because it was in Hawkeye's house in the country. It saved no purpose. It, it was sloppy character development. Oh, by the way, he's got a family and he's got this farmhouse. Yeah, it made you care so then when you thought you thought he was going to die. That's why yeah. you felt like... Don't make me feel. So, all the characters that die, if they're just going to be brought back in number four, which they will. If you're a kid going into this movie, or you're looking at it just as a story, oh my god, the end was so shocking. But the, being an adult who is interested in the behind the scenes of Hollywood as much as the actual films, if not more so, the fact that Black Panther made a billion dollars... Mm-hmm. A sequel to Spider-Man has already been announced, which may very well star Miles Morales over Peter Parker, but with such a talent as Tom Holland, it would be a waste to kind of kill him mm-hmm. off. He deserves a whole other movie to yeah. himself. And Doctor Strange, are quite like for people who don't read comics, like who the hell is this? He made $700 million by himself. So these are characters that are definitely coming back. And Chris Pratt said, like, sh- did a shout out to the actress who plays Manta saying, happy birthday, can't wait to film Guardians of Galaxy 3 with you. Now that might be like a curveball, but like, Guardians of the Galaxy has not only been announced, but we now know Star-Lord is coming back. So, like, a lot of the Guardians are going to come back. So, looking at it from an adult point of view, you know these characters are coming back. To come out of this movie thinking those deaths aren't permanent, and then to be probably be proven right, maybe not on the whole, across the board, to be proven right in number four would completely undermine this movie. Yeah, and it's kind of underwhelming to think, yeah. ah, they'll be but okay. They'll be back. I do think, if you look who's left, it's predominantly the founding members. Thor, Cap, Iron Man, Black Widow... Hulk, I'll probably be back in it. Unfortunately. Unfortunately, Hulk. And there's a few in there, like Nebula, Rocket, yeah. um, and so on. So though I think a lot of those characters from the Soul Stone are going to come back, and they will feel quite cheap. I do think we are still going to see Destin before. I think Chris Evans has always said multiple times he's not coming back. I don't think you could do much more with Tony Stark. Apparently it's going to be a Black Widow movie, which would have been perfect for 
2010, but yeah. we're in 2018, 2019 now. We're going into the realm of Guardians and Captain Marvel. Don't exactly. Think, it feels like such like a 10 years ago movie, yeah. not where the MCU is now. I think if you've got these characters, you've got the likes of Thor, you've got gods, you've got aliens, you've got humans, but who've been brought up on other planets. Why do you want to see Hawkeye and Black Widow, yeah. just regular human agents of Earth? Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., which has a whole TV TV show dedicated. <laughs> it's like, not that it's a particularly good TV show. Yeah. But if I want to see Secret Agents, I'll go watch the TV show. Exactly. I don't need a two-hour movie dedicated to it. No. It would have been perfect after Iron Man 2, when she was introduced. Yeah. It's too late for that now. Aside from maybe Thor, who's had a new lease of life because of mm -hmm. Ragnarok and Guardians, I can't see many of these characters come back. So basically, I think a lot of the fandom members will die. So that would be okay for me if a lot of these characters like Doctor Strange etc come back. Yeah. If the the payoff for that or the the sacrifice for that is to see the founder members go, I won't be that pissed off. But if they come back and we get an Iron Man 4 and a Captain America 4 and a Hulk movie, I'd be like, well what the hell was the point yeah. of Infinity War? Captain America when he was first introduced got um, the biggest round of applause. More, I don't think any other character for an introduction got a round of applause. Yeah, there was a lot of excitement. So Captain America is introduced in terms of helping Vision fight off the children of Thanos. The children of Thanos come down and basically try and hunt down Vision to get the Mind Stone out of his head. So that's Cap's big introduction is in a mm -hmm. random train station in Scotland. And that's where you kind of see like the I don't know if they call the new Avengers or the secret Avengers, basically the on the run Avengers. Basically everyone who was on Cap's side and against Tony and the Accords in Civil War. So you've got Cap, Falcon, um, Black Widow, I think Rhodey is now on their side, though that, that, that doesn't make any sense. So that is a big introduction to the movie and that's, that's the plot he segued into. The only other reaction, that sort of reaction was when Thor landed on Wakanda with Rocket on his shoulder. <laughs> that blew my mind. That got a big reaction. But in terms of character introduction, Cap was the only one that got like a rounding cheer and applause however he does nothing in this movie yeah he is so expendable he has so limited screen time i think he's gonna get a lot more number four because there's a lot less characters and i do want to see him interact with tony stark again because they haven't since civil war but these big awesome characters that like captain america and black panther which is now a phenomenon they really are expendable to yeah. the plot and i thought that was quite strange that I think if you told people who cheered when he was introduced this is his participation in the movie, they would just get silence because he does nothing. He looks cool with his longer hair and beard, but he does nothing. I honestly don't mind that though. But I just think, not one underuse of character, but like the trailers and everything built up look at Captain mm. America, look at his awesome introduction, he stands up to Thanos. The main answer, like, Cap's a big deal here, and he just really wasn't in this movie. Now, to be fair, he had Civil War dedicated to him, but there's a lot of characters in this movie that don't interact. So the team-ups are Thor, Rocket, and Groot. Yes. Thor meets the Guardians for a little bit. Yeah, this works, and personally, I think the the idea of Thor kind of being a segue in between Guardians of the Galaxy characters meeting Earthbound characters like Iron Man works really well. We all know the team ups and we all know all, all the different plot lines they go on. Thor goes to get his hammer, new hammer made with Rocket and Groot. Yep. Caps, Earthbound meets up with Black Panther to stop the battle on Wakanda. A lot of the Guardians, Star Lord and Tony Stark go to fight um, Thanos with Spider Man, yep. Doctor Strange. But that was an awesome scene when in the battle for Wakanda. When Bucky. When Bucky picks up yeah. Rocket and spins him <laughs> around. Rocket's like, how much for the gun? It's like, not for sale, how much for the arm? <laughs> it's awesome. <laughs> I'll get the arm. I can wait for the the re reunion of Tony Stark and Cap for number yeah. four. That'll be a big moment. That'll be a good moment. I thought a lot of the team-ups work. Yeah, I, I do think a lot of the team-ups work. Particularly Thor and the Guardians. Especially Thor and the Guardians. But there are also some team-ups that I just don't care about. Like? I don't care about the scenes with Captain America and his clan and Vision and Scarlet Witch. I just don't care. I feel as if their relationship has kind of been forced so that you care but the, when they yeah. kind of there was a lot of things that killed. didn't make sense with that batch yeah. of characters like Rhodey suddenly be after the events of Civil War and like fighting alongside Tony Stark and then becoming disabled in the battle at the airport to then just be okay with Cap like how you doing buddy how you doing Vision it's like these are the people which now cause you not being yeah. able to walk why are you suddenly okay with that a big love relationship like a, a romantic relationship between Bruce Banner and Black Widow they have like one meeting yeah and that's it it's like that's the only scene. They have literally no other lines, yeah. no other screen time apart from that. It's like, you built up this relationship, once again, out of nowhere in yeah. Age of Ultron, and then they finally reunite. It's like, yeah. 
I think it's the storylines that I just don't care about like that where you're like okay those characters can clearly go now because I um, have no invested interest in where, whether they live or die what's strange is all these characters in Wakanda don't they have no invested interest in Thanos what happens is the way they get involved in the plot is Bruce Banner gets sent down to Earth so Thanos is coming mm-hmm. none of these characters know who Thanos is none of these characters have ever met him or interacted with him before but then like yeah we'll stop him it's like Thor knows who he is because he's in the cosmos and gets his ass whooped on the ship Guardians know who he is because they've had dealings with mm-hmm. Ronan etc and Gamora has a very close connection Cap and Black Panther the first time they meet Thanos is in the last five minutes of the movie it comes down to Earth it's like I understand that you're heroes and therefore you've, you know a threat's coming so you've got to defend it but like they have no investment with the main villain and therefore the plot of this movie yeah. they're just there Thor against Thanos Tony Stark against Thanos like Tony Stark seems to be in my head the last six years all makes sense Black Panther Cap Vision etc be like oh we've got Thanos it was like who th- they must be like, who the hell is Thanos like, it's just so weird that they're so up for the fight that yeah. they don't even know who he is and they only meet him in the last five minutes though that scene where Cap is like holding back the gauntlet it's awesome because not only is he trying so hard and being so brave mm-hmm. in Europa Thanos looks quite bemused because he's so pathetic yeah. that is once again emphasising how great Thanos as a villain and Brolin's performance is three characters that you want to see survive out the whole cast like even the ones that have gone into this yes. past century the soul stone so you either want them to survive or you want them to come back well I know some are and three that you think are expendable no regardless of what you know forget everything yeah, yeah. you think the ones you I want to see I I would have been happy with even though it's my favourite Avenger I would have been happy for going but now seeing the <gasps> rejuvenation in Ragnarok and his participation with the Guardians I would love to see not necessarily a Thor movie, but Thor and Guardians team up more. So I want Thor to come back. What else do I want to see come back? I personally would love to see the Captain America franchise continue, but with Bucky taking on that mantle. So Chris Evans has said he's done. So I'm happy that character retiring or being killed off. That's fine. Yep. But the mantle, I think it'd be really interesting to give to a character like Winter Soldier who is so conflicted. And the fact that you think he signed off like a nine movie contract, I think he's probably only halfway through, wow. maybe a sign mm-hmm. that that character and that more grounded political plotline can continue with someone else so I'd like to see Bucky come back and and I want uh, there's two I want to come back I know you only said three but I want two Groot because I love him Groot picks up the Stormbreaker before Thor Groot is worthy Groot is worthy we, all, we already knew we already that know, though Groot's worthy and that's a strange because I'd love to see that franchise continue that's not the rules man I break, I break the rules <laughs> man so the four characters I'd love to see come back okay. for different reasons yeah. four car- three characters I don't want to see come back I want to see Tony Stark be killed off because I, you know, I love Robert Downey Jr. He's one of my favorite performers. He's just not a character. When you've got gods and monsters yeah. and titans and guardians, I don't really care about a rich guy in a suit. I'll just go watch a Batman movie. I want to see that <laughs> and see it done better. To be fair, so I don't care about Iron Man. I think Captain America has also served its purpose. I think I said that franchise can continue with a more interesting lead, conflicted lead, like Winter Soldier. A weird one though, I do like Vision. I don't think Vision can serve any purpose. He's never going to get his own movie. I don't really care for his forced relationship with Scarlet Witch. So the fact that Vision's gone and probably won't come back is fine by me. I like that he's a different character. I just don't... What movie is he going to pop up in? What can he do to enhance this universe? So there's a lot of characters that outside of those two groups I've named that I'd like to see come back and like to stay dead. But they're the ones that stand out for me that... I'd like to see you continue in the MCU and I'm not really bothered yeah. if they don't come back. Just going back to Vision, Age of Ultron, Vision was supposed to be like this all-powerful uber superhero. Godlike he was presented. And he does nothing. He, he does. He gets his ass handed to him. Time. <laughs> time and time again he gets his butt whooped in Scotland. Yeah. He's kind of, like the whole point of a concept of protecting Vision. So he's just kind of like really weak character that everyone's liability. put like exactly a liability that they're all putting their lives on yeah. the line for and it came across quite frustrating like you were supposed to be this godlike creature who helped stop Ultron and then was this kind of like major factor in Civil War and then you've done nothing but get whooped yeah. time and time again so Vision was quite frustrating in this movie mm-hmm. so the whole set of, of Wakanda is that Thanos is coming to get the yeah. Mind Stone from Vision he sends his children of Thanos to kind of get it first and so they basically come with like a nameless faceless army to try and get it while Cap Black Panther, etc. trying to defend Vision. This might really like, frustrate people and might actually ruin it for people now, but the whole Wakanda scene reminds me of the end of episode one, where they're fighting on Naboo, Jar Jar Binks, and the Gungans versus the droids. Now hear me out, it's because of the shield, it's because it's being filmed in the daytime and in a field, and it's just CGI versus CGI. 
did reminisce a lot of the end of episode one, especially when you cut away from Wakanda, you just seen something else exciting. That's the whole build up of episode one. Like right. we'll go from this fight to a lightsaber duel to a a fight in in the galaxy. That's what the end of Wakanda felt. It felt like the battle on the boo. I which... absolutely hated that scene. Wakanda. Yeah. Because it was just fighting. It was just fighting. It harks back to the first Avengers movie with just cgi and relentless action which the rest of the movie hadn't had the rest of the movie had action mm. but it was a really lovely well harmonized balance that was just not as messy as previous marvel films have been in their action yeah. but at the same time still too relentless it is the same old story of regardless yeah. of how groundbreaking this movie was in many ways the end of an avengers movie is just going to be the heroes against a bunch of cgi yeah chitauri Age of Ultron's duplicates, and I think they're so faceless and nameless. What are these creatures? They don't yeah. have a name, they don't have a species. Space dogs. Space dog. Who are the three characters that you'd like to see remain dead or die or come back? So, if you've asked me before this movie, I don't think I'd have said the ones that I pick now. This movie was a game changer for me. So, I want to see Spidey again. And specifically, Peter Parker, would you be happy with Miles Specifically, Peter Morales? Parker. I really like this rebirth this very of Spider-Man. kid who exactly. wants to please, and like when he becomes an Avenger, his little proud face. Yeah. It's like I do. And love he like this. does that little that little blink where he's like, okay, I've got to be like a grown up now. Yeah, he goes back it's to like being so, be cool, man. Yeah, it's so cute and it's endearing, and I want to see that because yes, okay, we see Iron Man become Iron Man, but he's already an adult. He knows his place in the world. Spidey, we're discovering that with him. He's a kid, and it's. it's the unique dynamic exactly and another thing that i picked up on in this movie as well is his relationship brief relationship with star lord because for star lord he was kind of beamed up in the 80s so every everything from the 80s is what is new <laughs> to him but yeah. it's also new to spider-man so they're talking about like footloose <laughs> and things it, like that was it is it still the best movie ever? It never was. Yeah. <laughs> That's such a I quirky little that. line. It never was. So I want to see them two back and I want to mm. see them back together. Do you think Starla was a bit of a douche in this movie? Kind of basically ruining it for everyone because he can't keep his temper? Yes. And I think that it's usually Iron Man who lets his emotions or his arrogance or his egotism get in the way. But this time we saw it in, saw it in Star Lord, which was interesting to see that shift. And she was like, he's human, he has emotions, exactly. he has faults. And but it was still annoying. It was very, very annoying. And I don't know, is it believable? Could you not just keep your shit together for two seconds longer? Why don't you just mourn after you've killed yeah. the big bad guy? Because it was at the second view and I realised how close they had to getting the gun yeah. off Spider-Man actually taking it off. Basically, the, the setup on Titan is this big grand battle, like an anti-gravity yeah. scene, which gives it a lot of dynamic aspects. And by that point, I believe Thanos has four out of the six Infinity Stones. He's coming to get the Time Stone from Doctor Strange, yeah. and then he has only one more to go, the Mind Stone from Vision. And basically, it's a big team up with some of the Guardians, Doctor Strange, Spider-Man, and Iron Man. And basically, they team up. And they emphasize that if you have just two Infinity Stones, like, you'd be the most powerful person ever. He has four by that point, and they still manage to take him down. So is the Infinity Gauntlet like that powerful? <laughs> they, they pick and choose whenever they want it to be powerful. But they all team up, and they manage to get it off almost when star lord finding out that his love gamora has been killed overreacts and basically messes the plan he attacks thanos kind of breaks him from his trance that Man mantis puts him in and it's the moment spider-man gets it off gets the gun off his hand that he reaches back and takes it so that have built a lot of tension when mm -hmm. you focus on that scene how close they are to getting it and how star lord messes it up but it's one of those moments of a lapse of judgment like you know how powerful this guy is you know what his intention is keep it cool keep yeah. it together then mourn but yeah. I don't know maybe if you were maybe you've just been killed by a big purple thumb I wouldn't know how to <laughs> keep my cool but it was a bit of a lapse in judgment yeah. on his part but it was serving to the character yes. this is the Peter Quill that we know and yeah. love he does overreact he is rash so you want to see Spidey back and you want to see Star-Lord yeah. he's a bit of a douche yeah. anyone else you want to see come back or live Groot I knew you'd want Groot well yeah, we so. already know Rocket's alive so he's safe I can you know stop worrying about him He's got to have Groot. Yeah, they don't work by themselves. They no. need each other. They are this generation's Han and Chewie. Yeah. So three characters you want to see either die or remain dead. 
I didn't include Hawkeye. He's my number four. He should die. <laughs> that should be the opening scene of four. Just it was like not even like Thanos kills him. He just walks out of his house and gets run over by a car <laughs> by, oh, no, by accident. It's like he's gone. Oh, oh well, like move on. <laughs> Go back into the cosmos. That'd be a perfect way for him to go. See, this is the thing. How much of a superhero can you be if you can just die by like food poisoning or something? <laughs> die from like, deli belly. Yeah, exactly. You're not gonna see Thor. I don't know. Maybe some space nuts out there. That I mean. <laughs> yeah, but undercooked so ignoring Hawkeye because we all want to see him go well Hawkeye was one of the ones on my list you've got, you've got to pick another one okay Black Widow don't care adds nothing to the plot anymore did back in the day did when they were rec- recruiting the Avengers she was a good recruiter yeah but now no don't care okay too human yeah we like that me and you in particular I think we like the Xenia yeah. aspects we like our Ant-Man's Thor's exactly. and Guardians I think yeah they've left Earth now. Mm-hmm. It's good to revisit with like Spider-Man because it's an endearing character, yeah. but like, I think Phase 4 and Beyond because they've hired James Gunn to kind of be the overseer of that, not just the writer Have and they? director of Guardians. Oh. I think they are going much yeah. more, which I want. So when you say like, we're going to do a Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3 and we're doing a Captain Marvel and we may do a Nova, and then go, and then there's Black Widow. Yeah, like, it's flat. So <laughs> it's like, yeah. So you don't want to see Black Widow anymore because she doesn't serve a purpose? No, Black Widow is too boring, too earthly for what I think Marvel has in store for us in the future. Phase one. Darling, you're so phase one. (laughs) Iron Man should have died in this movie. Yeah. Though I do like want to see him interact with Cap again. I after this movie do not care about Bruce Banner. I kind of think they slaughtered his character. You don't like the direction they've gone? No. Okay. He shouldn't be comedic I did actually like the internal struggle yeah but it's just undermined as a lot of moments are in this movie by the comedic aspect so Hulk can go Black Widow can go oh actually I have got another one Scarlet Witch can go you don't like her no in the last movie powers are very vague yeah she was like oh my god this new man-made superhero which they're trying to use for bad because she's just so powerful. And then in this movie, she's just kind of floating around until like... they really need her. And Black Panther's head of army, Okoye, says, where was Scarlet Witch earlier? Why didn't we just use her? And she is exactly right. They make her character so expendable in this film, and I don't really know why. Why can Black Panther or Cap or any kind of grounded, strong hero be mind and vision? when the one with all the superpowers should be in the battlefield. Yeah, just taking everyone out. Yeah, like, when they introduce characters like Thorne, Scarlet Witch, like, who then take out pretty much the army by themselves, like, it does completely undermine the more grounded Caps, Winter yeah. Soldiers, Black Panthers of the world. So the whole purpose of them going to this, like, dying star mm-hmm. is that this is the place where Mjolnir was created, and because it was created there and Thorne needs a whole new hammer, he has to go to get a whole new hammer. Now what you find out is that this is a kind of Cosmic Forge. I like it, a Cosmic Forge. And so you find out that actually Thanos has been here prior, made the dwarf giants create a device powerful enough to withstand the power of all the stones. So I introduced this character called Eitri, who I think not only made Thor's hammer, original hammer, but he's the one who made the Infinity Gauntlet. And what you find is that once he made it for Thanos, Thanos killed out basically his entire race and left him alive and basically took away the use of his hand so he couldn't build a gauntlet for anyone else. I don't know why he kept him alive. Because I think it's quite, it emphasizes his villainy, he's quite cruel. Right, like when he yeah, kills yeah. all his friends, his family, but then you know, the, the skill that you have I'm going to take away from you. So I think it adds into his villainy. Mm-hmm. It also is quite medieval. And so basically Thor, Rocket, Groot, and his character Eitri all band together to make Thor's hammer, which is a very good plot line. It's, if anyone you know, who's in, in, invested in the Thor plot line, I was like, what's he going to do out his hammer? It, it is, you know, it, it's a conclusion, it's a, res- it's a resolution for you. But what is so bizarre is Peter Dinklage's performance. Now, I really like Peter Dinklage. He's one of the standout characters in Game of Thrones. He put in a good performance in another superhero movie that he was in, X-Men, Days of Future Past. But I don't know if it's his bizarre acting choice or a bit off directing from the Russo brothers, but his performance mm-hmm. is just so bizarre. And it's more to do with his delivery. Yeah. Like, he's like, this is how a... This is how a giant would yeah, talk. Yeah, exactly. Like, look at it. This oh. is how a giant would talk. And, I... <laughs> and like, the post-production effects they put on, a voice, put on his voice 
hinders that even further. Yeah. So his delivery is so off. It's overacting as well. The first time was completely jarring and took me off the movie. The second time, because I knew what to expect, it wasn't that bad. But there were still some lines and delivery that was like, this feels like bad acting yep. 101. I completely disagree. The second time round was still just as off-putting for me. It took me out of the movie. All I could think about was, why is Peter Dinklage acting this way as opposed to what is going on in the, in the plot? Yeah. Maybe he was on set by himself, so yeah. he had like no like kind of chemistry to bounce off. Yeah. I know Hemsworth there. I don't know how he went about filming those it scenes. It was just really bad to yeah. the point that me and you were chuckling at it. Yeah. And it's like that's I uh, we've come to expect more from Marvel than that performance. The thing that Marvel can pride itself on, I think, aside from said what one or two of the villains not really hitting the mark, is that they attract phenomenal talent mm-hmm. and not only that the talent do the do deliver like your Benicio Del Toro's your Hugo Weaving's your Glenn Close's your Jeff Bridges all these kind of Hollywood legends that they bring in for kind of minor roles like your Robert Redford's to so people that prior to these movies were kind of undiscovered your Tom Hiddleston's Chris Hemsworth Sebastian Stans they all come and go that's why they chose them because they were the perfect fit this is I think the one time that a maybe aside from Edward Norton originally playing the Hulk that they've just been completely off the mark for casting yeah. and you think of the role and you think that think of the actor that they've chosen you think makes perfect sense but yeah. the performance is really quite jarring mm-hmm. but something I really liked about that scene was um, when they when Groot gives like a branch for you Thor's called that axe. before it was actually going to happen I did. Like, Groot will be the, the handle and he's worthy, so you know, I can pick it up. So yeah. I can fall. That's cool. But it really builds the chemistry between the characters as well. Like, they have this bond now, yeah. which isn't just on screen chemistry. It's, it's he's in his weapon, little yeah. arm. Yeah. So really? they have to stay together now. I, as I think I previously said in my review, every character has a purpose, no mm-hmm. matter how minor. You can take Cruz out of this movie and it'd be just as good. He doesn't really add anything mm. to it. He has a few chuckles of the fact he's like a teenager, he's uninterested in what's going on, he's playing this old retro <laughs> like video game. Space Invaders or I something. I think it must be Peter Quills from back in yeah, the day. Yeah. But basically you then find that, oh he does have a purpose because without him, the hammer, the weapon wouldn't be complete and then without the hammer, Thor can't kind of regenerate. Yeah. So that was a really good use of the character. In Thor Ragnarok, Thor is able to generate lightning himself. He doesn't need yeah. to rely on his hammer. So why in this movie does he think he needs an axe? Yeah, I mean, I think that is when one of the problems when you have a universe and there's so much continuity mm-hmm. is that the whole point of Ragnarok seemed to be the same with Iron Man 3 was the hero is Tony Stark, you know, the suit might be the power and the weapons, but he's the intellect and he's the heroic aspect of it. So Tony Stark's the hero, not Iron Man. It's like Thor Ragnarok, the whole point of him losing his hammer um, was the fact that it's Thor who is the hero. He the can, god of thunder. Yeah, he can conjure the lightning yeah. internally, and we saw that in the final battle on the Rainbow Bridge. So it did seem to be like a step backwards about that he needs a hammer to not only have any sort mm-hmm. of form of power, but also stay alive. So it kind of felt like it was reckoning what happens in Ragnarok. Because he's fought Thanos once and failed, mm. it's thrown him off. He's yeah. not as confident. He needs something, Absolutely, a, a, a yeah. weapon. I think that's the whole point of his purpose. That's mm-hmm. his motive, that he clearly fights Thanos at the beginning of the movie which you don't get to see thanks Marvel and then he even says like basically he says the Guardians are fought and once I won't lose again like why won't you lose again he's like this time I'll have a hammer so that is his whole purpose to go off and get it's a hammer it's like a pacifier yeah but it's making sense of why was he why did the hammer bring him back to life if, did yeah, it? yeah he was dying and, it, and yeah, Groot right, have yeah. to like form the hammer and yeah. give it to him for him to stay alive I was like well I thought we got past that point the things in New York don't really click with me like I'm so sick of things taking place in New York well, that's now. That's the whole point of the MCU. It's like, that is their whole Yeah, New York no, City. which I completely get. But when you have the rest of the galaxy now, it falls flat, it's old, you're revisiting the same tropes over and over again. So I'd say the first major fight scene set in New York is a bit... Flat. Compared to what comes later, mm-hmm. a bit more grandiose, etc. It does fall a bit flat. It feels like we're watching the first Avengers movie yeah. again, but on a smaller scale. So that's really work. Definitely agree. The fight scene on Titan is incredible. It's great to see all these different skill sets yeah. coming together, being harmonised. It's the most dynamic fight I think you've ever done in a Marvel movie. Definitely. It's really interesting to see characters working together 
as opposed to all working together but in different fight scenes mm. this is all one fight yeah. scene everybody comes together and it works so like every marvel movie there is the obligatory after credit scene mm -hmm. My interest in these has waned a little bit. Like, I do always stay for the after credits, but it's not like the early days where, like, seeing Thor's hammer or seeing Loki return to build towards the Avengers got you really pumped what was next. I think they have kind of diluted them by, in some cases, waiting for, like, through two, three, maybe even five minutes of credits for, like, Howard the Duck. <laughs> They've kind of undermined their own after credits. The after credit scene is we actually do see Nick Fury. We were told he wasn't in this movie, but he and Maria Hill are both in this movie. They're just driving a car, and then it's kind of like the leftovers where people just start fading, so cars start crashing, people start disappearing off the street. They get out the car, they're very shocked. It's actually quite a prolonged after credit scene, mm -hmm. I thought. Both Nick Fury and Maria Hill do fade um, away, but before that happens, Nick Fury seems to be sending a message on some sort of 90s come cosmic pager pager and then he fades away the pager falls to the floor we zoom in to the pager and is the captain marvel logo question question <laughs> <laughs> was captain marvel already announced before this film came out yes how can you be excited or teased if you already know the next film that's to come yeah that's what was always cool about marvel movies is that before everything was so concrete mm -hmm. like seeing thor's hammer etc like we knew it was getting filmed, but they, like, they definitely are going for this universe combination. And also it was great, like, say, at the end of Guardians of the Galaxy, where they teased a big character called Adam Warlock. It's like, well, we weren't sure that was going to happen, so that would be cool for Guardians Volume 3 and possibly the more cosmic movies. To te as you say, to tease a character that has already been announced, has already been cast, mm -hmm. and we've already seen leaked set photos of, it's not all that exciting. It would have been cool to see her, or it would have been cool to set up a major plot line for Avengers 4 so though I've been blown away for a while with the Marvel after credits I was ex expecting something more for the after credit of Infinity War and plus I don't really care for the fate of Nick Fury and M Maria Hill either I no. think their characters like <laughs> Hawkeye and like Black Widow that should have gone a long time ago let's face it like yeah. Nick Fury has served his purpose so I just wasn't bothered that they faded away so not bothered about their fate mm -hmm. and I said great I saw Captain Marvel's logo I can pick up a comic and see a logo mm -hmm. it, it didn't really do anything for me but what would have been cool is to perhaps show a clip from Avengers 4 because that's basically what they did at the end of one of the movies in Phase 2 they took a clip from Civil War and showed Cap kind of capturing Bucky if they could have talked like a meeting between Cap and Tony Stark it would have been a lot cooler because though they're not new characters it's like it is teasing major plot points from mm -hmm. before this was like okay we all everyone in this midnight screening is all fully mm -hmm. aware that captain marvel is coming it does feel as if as these films are progressing and we are getting better films we are getting worse after credit scenes yeah i think it's because everybody and their dog knows it's a connected universe now so they don't have to like make you stay because like oh believe me it's worth it it's a fantastic mm -hmm. after credit scene so they don't have to go oh you will see thor's hammer oh you'll see loki return or you'll see thanos but i think you're right that they are trying less because they know they don't have to try as hard to keep you there because it is kind of like marketing it's like go see the next one because this is yeah. what's going to happen it's like they they know everyone's going to see the next mm -hmm. one anyway so they don't have to try we get shawarma scenes and how the duck as the as you said as the popularity of the movies has grown the quality mm -hmm. or the excitement surrounding the after credits mm -hmm. certainly has gone down and just one as well like guardians volume two there's a mix of humor and tease and things to come there was like four or five after credits scene i was expecting at least two from mm -hmm. this movie like immediately right off the bat yeah. then an after credits one but to just have one and to be quite lackluster there was a mm -hmm. disappointing so anticlimactic all around i think for such a awesome movie yeah so that was our spoiler chat if you'd like to see what we thought in a more you know, constructed point of view go check out our review video which is our first ever review video on this channel if you liked our video please like share and subscribe but we hope you enjoyed it. See you next time. Thanks for watching. Not as good as X-Men's version of Quicksilver with Peter Evans. Yeah. Or Evan, maybe Evan Peters. <laughs> it doesn't matter. <laughs> He's got two first names. <laughs> this is what's wrong, Marvel. You listen to me. I make a better movie for you. <laughs> this is a... What the holy hell's a rookie reel? <laughs> It really undermined the female characters that they were only allowed to fight other female characters. What was that about?
I'm being a little bit too, poli too political here, so let's, let's move on. Am I saying his name right? You are. Heimdall. Heimdall! <laughs> this DC is this allowed? Yeah. It? It's like a poison chalice. So I. Oh, you're drinking. I pick out the pool and eat it. <laughs> I've got better guests that might give me some answers. <laughs> Teenage Mutant Grootie Turtle. <laughs> that didn't go. That didn't go. <laughs> I would do like the Marvel movie. Liked what you saw and have an interest for travel and adventure? Check out our other YouTube channel, Roman Rookies as you travel across 14 countries in an 11 month whirlwind of fun and excitement. Just click here or the link in the description below. Thanks for watching.